both them. He is going to uh, talk about Eaton cosmology, and I'm not going to give a big introduction to him. And uh, uh, he will mostly talk about these papers that have written in the board. And uh, please, Professor. Okay, so let's start right away. Um, first question is: Can you all hear me? You can. Yes. 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 Anyone, yes, we can uh, hear you. Yes. You can, you can hear me. Okay. And I hope you can also see what's written on the blackboard. I will try to uh, write in with uh, large letters. So I have to see where. Ah, yeah. This is this is where I have to be. Uh, so, well, first of all, thanks for inviting me to the seminar. This is my first uh, online uh, seminar, but I'm happy that uh, the new regulations. We're now allowed to have at least a handful of people sitting in the, in the seminar room, so I won't be talking to empty space. Um, so this is what I'm going to talk about, is some work I, I've done with, uh, I did with Axel Kleinschmidt already a while ago. Um, uh, and uh, well, there are basically two reasons why I returned to, by the way, uh, why I'm bringing this up now, because first of all, uh, many of the issues that were raised in this paper remain un unresolved to this day, so there has not been uh, much progress. And the other uh, reason is that, uh, you know, recently there's also been increased in interest in cosmology uh, from the point of view of uh, fundamental theory. And as you know, at the moment, there's a big debate in the string community whether uh, ES vacua allowed or whether it has to be uh, quint essence. So I think uh, uh, this work uh, uh, sheds uh, some you know, different light on, on these issues and this is why I want to explain it. And I will try to be a pedagogical in this talk. So uh, if there's any, anything you, any question you might want to ask, short question at least, we can try to answer them during the seminar, otherwise we'll postpone them to the end of the seminar. Um, and this, this work is based on uh, somewhat earlier work by Townsend and Wolfhard. This was 2003, Wolfhard and uh, also Ota. Now, you all know that one of the basic issues in cosmology, in cosmology, The question what is how does the scale factor behave as a function of, of time? Because uh, um, describing the evolution of the universe uh, since the uh, Big Bang is also about what is the profile of this function. And as you know, this is, uh, this is uh, rather well under control in observational cosmology. People, uh, when you solve the Friedman equation, you model various kinds of contribution of the right-hand side of the Friedman equation. Uh, and in particular, there's this issue with the dark energy, uh, which is a phenomenon that emerged only very late in the, the history of the universe. So one question is, uh, I mean, what can fundamental theory say about this? Is there any way to predict uh, predict the evolution? Of course, this would be the dream, but but uh, somewhat more modestly, one may ask, is there any kind of constraint or input or partial prediction from a more fundamental point of view? And uh, this is actually where these papers come in uh, because they uh, were able to construct a cosmological uh, solutions of uh, N-theory or rather 11-dimensional supergravity. And much of this filters down to 10-dimensional supergravity theories and other supergravity theories. And these uh, solutions exhibit an interesting profile here for this uh, 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 the time dependence of this uh, cosmic cosmological scale factor. Uh, they do not pretend to be uh, realistic solutions, but a very interesting feature is uh, that they exhibit uh, phases of uh, decelerating. And accelerating uh, 
function. In the sense that you get a solution that at times uh, it expands, but with a, at a decelerating rate, and then in between there's a period of accelerating expansion, and then it turns over into a decelerating expanding universe again. Which means that there are solutions that are about the question now would be is uh, will this star energy continue to dominate the evolution of the universe forever, or or is it possible in such a theory you have a um, a solution with more intermittent kind of behavior, and this is where uh, they were able to construct uh, interesting solutions of this type. Uh, so, I have a question. Yes. So, is there any kind of a uh, phase transition type of thing from this symmetric phase to Yes, I, I guess you can also discuss phase transitions from this point of view, but I will not say anything about them. I will simply be concerned about constructing, first of all, with these solutions, but then reconstructing them from a, a very different uh, point of view. So, uh, so these solutions, as I said, were originally obtained by simply solving the Einstein equations in an appropriate context, uh, where also the internal space uh, sort of also becomes uh, uh, time dependent. And uh, we got onto this from a different point of view, as I said, and this was work that had been done previously by Damour Renault and uh, myself. Uh, maybe a description or understanding the dynamics of uh, EKL like uh, dynamics here or the vicinity of a cosmological or space like singularity. And the result was that this. Of course, this is something I've been studying for a long time, uh, since the early 70s. But the new point of view here was that one can very neatly describe or understand the dynamics in terms of uh, uh, something we call uh, cosmological billiards. Cosmo billiards for sure. And this billiard, these billiards take place in the wide chamber of uh, an indefinite Katsumuri algebra. Of some indefinite Katsumuri algebra. Uh, there's no time here to explain all the mathematics, but I will try to at least give you a flavor or provide some explanations as I go, go along as to uh, what this is. And in this way, uh, um, one, it, it turns out that, uh, that uh, there's a very neat transcription between properties of this algebra on the one hand and the occurrence or non-occurrence of chaotic oscillations of the metric with the singularity. Because you may know that this was one of the basic discoveries of EKL, that as you approach the initial singularity, there are chaotic oscillations. There can be chaotic oscillations of the metric, but there are also other models where these chaotic oscillations do not uh, take place. And it turns out that uh, just by looking at what kind of that's Moody algebra, one has one can tell immediately whether there's chaotic, there are chaotic oscillations or there are no chaotic oscillations. This is related to what's called the hyperbolicity of, the, of this Katsumuri algebra. So there was uh, one observation, but then one can take this uh, a little further because the original EKL story was mainly about a diagonal. Uh, scale factors, which means the diagonal entries of the, of the spatial metric. So one simply studies uh, the behavior of these uh, diagonal metric coefficients. So one uh, assumes um, a homogeneous but non-isotropic universe, where so for each direction the behavior can be different. And uh, one can of course then ask, if one simply takes this as a first order approximation, 
one can ask whether this can also be extended to other degrees of freedom, like off-diagonal metric degrees of freedom, or also whether one can include a metric, uh, uh, non-metric matter degrees of freedom into this description. And so I have one more question. So you have said about chaotic oscillation. Yes. So where is exactly at the solution level or uh, solution level means I'm not asking whether it appears in the scale factor or? It appears you, you simply take the metric, you take the diagonal entries of the metric, mm -hmm. you parameterize them as functions of time, and then you study the behavior of, this, of these coefficients as you approach the singularity. And then it turns out that in those cases where well, there's chaos, then these uh, coefficients will jump around. Uh, um, I mean, they're basically Castle solutions, but they're Castle solutions with, with Castle coefficients that change an infinite number of times between epsilon greater than zero and epsilon equal to zero. So this is, this is what makes the uh, study of singularities in this context uh, difficult. But on the other hand, it is one of the fundamental insights of a mathematical cosmology. And in fact, I personally think that this, this should, it should play some role you know, in explaining understanding the origin of the universe. Also because there's this beautiful underlying mathematical uh, structure. So as I said, what we would like to extend this picture to uh, something beyond diagonal metric scale factors. And uh, this has then led to a conjecture um, in my work with uh, Thibaut Darrou and Marc Hainaut, that in fact there's some kind of a dual, well, I think that this, this, this word dual has been misused, or I mean, it's used in many, many different ways. So I'll also use it as sort of cavalier way. There's a du dual description description of, let's call it M theory. But of course, when I say M theory, I really mean 11 dimensional supergravity uh, in terms, in terms of um, a one dimensional cosine space model of uh, one dimensional model that, that is described in terms of the Katsumudi group associated with this uh, Katsumudi algebra divided by its maximal compact subgroup. And for the rest of the talk, there are other examples, other Katsumudi algebras, but I will simply concentrate on the most interesting case, which is maximal uh, supergravity. And in this case, um, the, the coset is E10, a group. And you should realize when I write this down, claim this is a group, I literally, literally don't know what I'm talking about. But anyway, let's pretend we know what it is. So it's this group divided by its maximal uh, com compact subgroup. Um, so this is very much an analogy with uh, finite dimensional uh, uh, sigma models or sigma models based on finite dimensional groups. This in high dimensional supergravity theories, its scalar sectors are always described by such a cosets where you have a, a, a non-compact group and the scalar degrees of freedom, they live on this coset where you divide by the maximal uh, compact uh, subgroup. So as I said, I have no time to explain this the mathematics in any detail, but for the present purposes, it's completely sufficient. If you think about uh, the case of gravity, where this would be GLN divided by SON, which is the Lorentz group. So, uh, so this is this is the maximal impact group. So here we're simply extending uh, uh, this, this structure, which is very well known from supergravity series, um, finite dimensional, uh, with finite dimensional sigma models. We're simply blithely extending this to uh, the infinite dimensional case. Uh, now, one dimensional, 
of course, that means uh, with really re looking at the reduction to one time dimension in this case. And uh, those of you who know about BKL uh, will remember that this was also uh, a feature of this BKL analysis because BKL uh, postulated that as you approach the singularity, you can neglect spatial gradients in comparing them to the time derivatives. And then they said, we're going to set up some kind of expansion, but in first approximation, the Einstein equations decouple into continuous superpositions of one dimensional systems. So you have a Kasner system at each point in space. So that's the one dimensional, uh, why I put one dimensional here. And the other reason one dimension comes in is from supergravity, from the reduction, dimensional reduction of supergravity. We know that these, or we expect these uh, infinite dimensional groups to appear, as was first shown by Kemmer and Julia. This is the famous E7 of an incorrect supergravity. And if you take this further down, then you get to E10 by the time you reach one time limit. So this uh, fits together. However, as I said, I will not have time to, uh, to explain all the mathematics here, but at least I want to give you a flavor of what this has got to do with the level dimensional supergravity. And this can be seen as follows. I will not draw a Dinkin diagram. So, so this is the Dinkin diagram for E10. Okay. So this is the Dinkin diagram of E10. And there's a prescription given this Dinkin diagram, you can generate this, uh, the algebra from it, this cuts through the algebra, which turns out to be very infinite dimensional. But uh, how do you see the connection of this now with, with the supergravity? And this is uh, done in terms of what the so-called level expansion. And this means the following. Um, to do this, you single out one particular root, and the root that we will single out is this one, so let's call this alpha zero. Uh, you could also do it with other roots, but let's just stick to this example. And then we simply write any root, positive root, uh, can always be represented in the following form, namely L times alpha zero plus uh, a sum so the other simple roots with positive coefficients, so J goes from one to nine in this case. And then the number of times this uh, root A of A zero occurs, this is what's called uh, the level. And by looking at this, you see that uh, what it really means is that I decompose the algebra in terms of the algebra corresponding this, to this line, which is just uh, A9 or SL10, just SL10, or rather if I also take the cut off generator from this, it becomes GL10. So what this really means is that uh, I can decompose the E10B algebra in stacks of representations of this subalgebra SL10. So it simply means I can, I could, in principle, I could tell you what E10 is in terms of an infinite stack of uh, SL10 tensors. Uh, that make up the real algebra. So that's what this is. And then if you actually do it, you will realize the following. So level zero, um, that's just uh, this line, no root from here. That gets associated with, uh, with uh, so the graviton, if you like, or the metric. Um, I don't want to be more precise than this at this point. Uh, uh, just, just give you the flavor of this. So L equals one, then corresponds to the three form, which we all know and from the dimensional supergravity. Uh, L equals two is a six form. Uh, L equals three is associated with uh, something that we call dual graviton. So what you recognize here then is the field content of 11-dimensional supergravity, the metric, the boson field. 
uh, three form. And then the sixth form is the magnetic dual of the three form. And this dual graviton, in some sense, is the magnetic uh, analog of the metric or the field line. Okay, so you see that there's a very nice uh, correspondence here. But if you now try to go further in L, and all hull plates lose. So this has been done up to level uh, 28, meaning 20 uh, up to a coefficient where L is less than or equal to 28. And then you already find the number of irreps is uh, on the order of 4 times 5 times 10 to the nine. 10 to the 9 SL10 tells us. I'm just saying this to give you an idea because this looks fairly innocent. You think, well, what's the big deal? You know, if I take away these two nodes, it's just the A, that's the final dimensional. Yeah, Why I don't this is uh, like fractional four point five. No, the, what I'm just saying is 4.5 billion representations. Oh, right. So it's 450 zero, 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 zero. so. So it's, I, I'm just saying this to, to make clear because when, the, when people talk about this, what often doesn't come across is that the monstrous complexity of the V algebra and how little we have really understood. And I, I should say that when this was first done, well, the V algebra has been known for more than 50 years. Uh, our work back was in 2000. Um, and since then, in all those years, no real progress on, on this. And of course, it gets worse as you go further. So, question. So, when L, L is larger than 3, say, yes. yet at the international level, don't you expect some, some problems for them? Well, uh, the, the thing is, of course, uh, I mean, we, not even at that level where I could answer that question, because we just have no handle on this Lie algebra. So, uh, I mean, to approach it from this, this point of view looks a bit hopeless. But, uh, well, you know, as you know, we physicists don't, if I had known all the mathematics about this, of this real algebra, I wouldn't even have gone started because it's completely hopeless. But as physicists, we just start calculating. And in fact, that uh, there are some nice things you can calculate, even, you know, just restricting attention to this small sector of uh, degrees of freedom. So, and uh, maybe I should also say the conjecture, because this is also something, that could, the real conjecture is, that comes with this, is that actually, uh, as we go to this, towards the singularity, we go to one, at one spatial point, somehow space disappears, but it sort of reappears via the Lie algebra, in the sense that We've lost the information in this way of looking at it. We've lost the information about the spatial degrees of freedom. But effectively, the expectation is that when we really understand the Lie algebra, go to arbitrarily high levels, we will be able to recover all the space dependence for all these features. But it would be different from this is not a field theory in any, in any sense. And one, one of the big unsolved problems is to really get this to work is beyond the first few levels. So this is this is what's behind this uh, structure. So this is one scheme uh, to think about emergent uh, space-time and quantum gravity. Very different from uh, things that are usually done, homography and so on. Although this is also some kind of homography in the sense where you you know, there's just one dimensional uh, line, and this is where all the information gets coded into. So, uh, this is where we are. So, that, um, so, of course, the big aim would be to understand this structure, get all this to work, and so on. But uh, in this talk, I will be much more modest than possible with this work. Um, so, let's, let's, um, so the aim, our aim back then, was simply to understand these cosmological solutions in terms of this description. And the question was, can we recover uh, these uh, solutions in terms 
of a description in terms of this uh, infinite dimensional two set model. And so this is what I want to talk about in the rest of this uh, seminar. And maybe already at this point emphasize an important feature, which is that in this uh, context, we're not able to get solutions that are static or BPS. Uh, there's always a non-trivial time dependence. You cannot get a non-trivial solution that, has, that does not have a, uh, a non-trivial time dependence. Now, at the time we thought, well, let's uh, draw back because we cannot really recover ADS4 cos S7 or ADS5 cos S5. But on the other, other hand, maybe that's, that's the way nature is because if you look out from the outside the window, we don't see PPS or static solutions. We see a time evolving, uh, time dependent cosmology. Okay, so next step is to wipe the blackboard. And this could be a little bit wet. So as I said, this algebra is uh, monstrously complex, so we are uh, complicated, so we have to simplify life a little bit, or maybe substantially even, and this we do as follows. First of all, I want to give you a little bit of mathematical setup, how to derive equations of motion, and so on in this uh, context. And this is simply, be, this is simply done by following the usual uh, sigma model technology. So we start out with, uh, with this element of this concept, and uh, this is parameterized as follows. And for this, well, let me first write it and then I'll explain what it is. So it's alpha and it's S. Um, a alpha S. So, times. to line by i of t to the i. So this is a formal description of the element of this coset space. So what you see here is first of all uh, the Cartan subalgebra, that's hi. Uh, the corresponding fields are called phi and they will be related to the diagonal metric coefficients. Uh, here you see the positive step operators of this Lie algebra. Uh, so alpha is a positive root. Uh, the sum runs over all possible, all positive roots. There are now infinitely many of those. And furthermore, and this is where these indefinite Katzmudi algebras differ from the finite dimensional ones. For each root, we need an extra label S that runs from one to what's called the multiplicity of the root. For a given root, uh, you may have, or you will have more than one uh, element in this root space and correspondingly more fields. And uh, one of the difficulties here is that this multiplicity grows exponentially as you move into the uh, Katsumudi algebra. Uh, so the other thing, what you see here, is that the negative step operators, uh, lowering operators are missing. And this is the effect that comes from dividing up on this, uh, this maximal compact subgroup. This is just like a field, field bind. When you exploit the Lorentz invariance, you can bring it to upper triangular form. So this is a precise analog of that. So uh, let's pretend we know what this is. So the next step is to calculate the Cartan form. Now oh, everything just depends on T uh, because we're one dimensional. So let's write this as P plus Q, curly P of P plus curly Q. And this decomposition is uh, done in such a way that this Q belongs to the compact subalgebra. Okay, and then this is in the orthogonal complement. So this is exactly uh, when you have a GLN of a SON sigma model, that is exactly the same procedure. Then the Lagrangian is very simple. So it's L of T. We simply write something like this. 
uh, there are two things I have to explain here. First of all, this is a generalized lapse because the theory is supposed to be invariant, still invariant on the uh, uh, reparameterization of the time parameter. So this is something we must include here. Uh, this here is the so-called bilinear form on the Katsumudi algebra. Uh, this would be the trace in the standard setting, finite dimensional setting, and one nice feature why Katsumudi algebras are special and useful here is that even in the infinite, infinite dimensional case, you have such a bilinear uh, form, which can be uh, constructed to give a Lagrangian. So, uh, I have a question. Yeah. So, this lapse function is time dependent. Yes, it's time dependent, but at, at the end of the day, you can even fix a gauge for it, just like in general relativity. So that's why I'm asking that you also have something called shift. The shift is not here because we want just one dimension. Oh, you see, the shift, uh, this has to come in a different way, which we don't understand yet in this one dimensional description. But you're right that if we eventually make a connection with the full Einstein equations, we'll also have to account for the shift. So, from this we get equations of motion. They're also very simple. Namely, um, uh, first of all, when you vary with respect to this field, uh, the equation is simply, uh, let me see, uh, dt n to the minus 1 p plus uh, q. Or we can also write this as a kind of covariant derivative. Uh, dt n minus 1 uh, minus 1 p is equal to 0. Um, and please note that it, even though this is, as I said, it's horribly infinite dimensional, but by making suitable truncations, as we, what we'll see in a moment, we can make all of this completely modified. Of course, we're just in a tiny, tiny, tiny infinitesimal subset or subsector of this, of this the algebra. So that's one equation of motion, and the other is the Hamiltonian constraint obtained by varying with respect to n. And that simply says that uh, um, h equals e, e is equal to a zero. And now you see why indefinite is important. Isn't the first one looks like kind of uh, Liouville equation? We'll get to that, yes. We will get the Liouville equation in a moment. I, I'll show you how to get a Liouville equation out of this. So let me just say the following. So the indefiniteness of the Lie algebra is absolutely crucial here. You wouldn't be able to do this with a finite dimensional Lie algebra, a simple Lie algebra, because then this capital Keeling form is positive definite. So you just get the uh, a trivial solution, P equals zero. But here, because it's indefinite, this is, this is a property of this Lie algebra. This, this equation has no trivial solution. It's just like the Hamiltonian constraint in, in gravity, where you have plus and minus contributions. So what does this tell us? Uh, this tells us that uh, what we here have is a null geodesic solution on, on this cosine space. So geodesic because of this, and null because of this, because it's like this, this p is like the velocity, and this just means that the velocity is zero, and that is uh, zero and all. So the whole idea about this is that you know all that's sort of contained in supergravity, or you know that's the dream, of course, but that's not yet proven. Uh, but the expectation is that we can map these complicated field equations essentially to a non-geodesic motion on this infinite dimensional coset space. Um, uh, now, finally, I should also say that because this is one dimensional, we have this huge infinite dimensional symmetry, you can actually solve, uh, solve this formally. So formal solution. Well, you just observe that just like in every sigma model, there's 
a conserved current or conserved charge. We have to discover how to work that. And that is given by uh, uh, into the minus one, I think. Yes, N E E into the minus one is conserved, which means phi independent. Uh, this follows directly from the equations of motion. And then you can actually solve as follows by writing uh, E U of T J, when U is simply the integral of, uh, of this uh, lapse function. Uh, then we have a sort of initial value, and then we need a compensating rotation in K10 to move this thing back to the a tri triangular gauge Ugasawa or Ugasawa. So this this is the general solution. It's but it's very formal, and uh, it's not very useful actually because uh, first of all we don't know how to handle the real algebra, and secondly we have no understanding of the physical uh, meaning of these uh, uh, of these higher degrees of freedom or high level. Uh, states and uh, looking at these cosmological solutions was also done in, in an attempt to possibly understand the physical significance of the higher level states that appear uh, beyond. So, uh, I have a more elementary question how, how, how do you get the fermionic fields from, from this? What? How do I get what? Fermionic fields. Ah, well, that's another completely different story. Uh, uh, I would have to tell you some other time because this would be distract us too much. In fact, this is why we stopped doing cosmological uh, solutions because we then got into fermions. And then we spent like, what, eight years doing fermions. So, so let's now simply uh, start make an ansatz and try to solve it. So maybe I have another blackboard, but things out of the Another one. Okay, so we now want to, uh, of course this, as I said, we cannot handle in the, in the general way. So let's make a more specific ansatz. Uh, to see whether we can um, actually find a solution, how it's related, and find out how it's related to this uh, Townsend Wolfhard uh, solution. So, so let's therefore just to be completely general, let's just pick some root. Um, okay. This can be any any root. Um, uh, which imply if this is a root, then of course we know that alpha has to be less than two. If alpha squared is two, then one speaks of a real root. If alpha squared is zero, it's a null root. But then there's a huge set of what's called what we call timeline roots or imaginary roots that square to something negative. And then uh, the associated element of the Kaplan subalgebra is the following. And then you can check, this follows from the defining relations of the Lie algebra. You have the following relations. In this alpha uh, is H. Okay, this follows from, from, as I said, this follows from the defining relations of the from the algebra, and then we also know that h is e plus minus alpha is equal to plus or minus alpha squared e plus alpha. So uh, for finite dimensional the algebra, you only have real roots, and in that case, uh, uh, this is always true, say for simply lays the algebra. But what can happen here is is, is that the root becomes imaginary or is imaginary, in which case alpha squared is negative. And this will also be important. And furthermore, we have the bilinear form. We actually also calculated 
very easily. Um, well, this is one, and h is h is just alpha squared. And as I said, you know, this bilinear form can assume both positive and negative values. So the simplified ansatz now, um, as I said, this is this is the most general ansatz. This is the one we cannot handle. Therefore, we make a very sim much 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 simpler ansatz, and uh, we simply say we take such a rule and we write v t equal to e to the a of t the alpha times uh, e i of t h with these with these values. Okay, and this this uh, this is um, a rather simple system because uh, that's basically just uh, SL two. So in this case, since we have a complete uh, a commutation relation, so we can work out all these things. Uh, um, so we can work out what this is. Uh, so we can at least write this, uh, because then what we get is uh, v to the so it's almost v like to the minus one e to the v. Is equal to um, so uh, one more question. Yeah, let me just write it and then I answer your question. Uh, yeah, I know this one. Uh, dt a plus alpha uh, plus i. So, what's your question? Yeah, so uh, since the solution of the ansatz. So you have taken as a product of two uh, exponentials. Yes. I'm just asking that, uh, like, whether and also h and e is uh, not exactly commutative because it's proportional to alpha square something. So, like, some kind of Baker candle or yes, yeah, yeah. You just, you just use standard formulas to work this out. This this is just the standard textbook formulas e to the minus x t by dt e to the x uh, this, and in fact uh, this commutes with itself so you just get this uh, here of course you have to, to uh, uh, pay attention to the fact that e alpha and h don't commute but they simply follow this relation which is fairly straightforward and then it's, a, it's an elementary calculation to see that these extra commutators give you this factor in front so that's uh, uh, that's all there is. And now, in order to go to the equations of motion, we have to uh, eliminate uh, the part that lies in, uh, in the compact subalgebra. And for this, uh, we simply write uh, E alpha as one half E alpha plus E minus alpha plus one half E alpha. Minus e minus alpha, and then we notice that this is like anti-symmetric matrices, so this goes. So this is eliminated. That gives the Q, and then the P is simply this times this plus d t phi times h. So that's that's all there is. And uh, once you have that, you can write um, a simple. Uh, and we get, uh, let me see. So the um, Lagrangian is then simply, um, I put the n equals to one, never mind, alpha squared over two, uh, dt pi squared, uh, pi squared, plus, and if we call this here uh, p alpha, just for the sake of it, then we get one quarter. P alpha squared. So that's very simple functions. And now uh, this is easy to integrate because, uh, as you can see in the Lagrangian, we have dTa dTa times this e to the minus 2 alpha squared phi. So varying a, we simply get an uh, um, equation that 
e to the minus two alpha squared pi uh, times a dot is equal to a, which is an integration constant. And then we can simply substitute, replace a dot by this. Uh, and then uh, the equation simply becomes, um, uh, let me see, uh, so we get Et uh, second derivative pi uh, plus one half or one quarter maybe a squared e to the uh, two alpha squared phi. So here's your Liouville equation. Uh, to simplify life, we define a new constant. So we say phi bar bar phi is alpha squared phi of t. And we also introduce c, which is one half or one quarter. We have this. Um, so uh, this is the new field. Uh, here, uh, we notice that this, this depends on alpha squared, so c can be positive or negative. And then the equation simply becomes, uh, in terms of this, it's just phi double dot plus c times e to the uh, so phi. So this uh, scripted phi is dimensionless? Well, what do you mean is dimensionless? Uh, because alpha squared phi has to be dimensionless because you have defined that. Uh, well, I, I, I think, I, you know, let's not worry about dimensions. You can v uh, uh, to make things uh, commonly dimension. Yes, it's, this, this is not an essential point. But as you see here, this is a Liouville equation. And it can be solved by the following. You can also write it so there's some kind of conserved quantity. E to the 2 phi is equal to another integration constant which we call E. So this, um, okay. So it's just a standard Liouville equation um, in which we can solve. Uh, uh, well, you have to this, I mean, this you can look up in our paper. Um, you have to distinguish whether E is positive or negative. You have to distinguish whether C is positive or negative. Uh, for example, if, um, if both uh, C and E are positive, then the solution is uh, phi minus log uh, square root C over E times a hyperbolic cosine. Uh, that's one and then for the other cases you have similar solutions I will not write them down there's uh, uh, not that much time left uh, so it's it, this is just a standard uh, Liouville equation for which it, so solutions can be obtained explicitly and uh, um, yes this is sort of typical. Uh, you can already see this exponential behavior of the of the metric. It's sort of already see it uh, uh, in the fog, if you like, because because the metric, as I said, the e to the phi is something like a metric coefficient. So the e to the will undo this, and then you have a Koch-like solution, which is really for large times, say, uh, really like exponential. So so that's. No, let's, but let's not forget, there's another equation here. So here, what do you mean by large time, the late time? Scale? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so we've solved this equation. Remember, this was done by, you know, we have cut down the, the infinite complexity of the Lie-out by simply restricting to some kind of, uh, something like the SL2 subalgebra, uh, which of course, everybody knows how to um, work with. And you can think of this, this E10 group as being composed of an infinite number of such SL2 algebras. But then, of course, the, the problem comes when you try to uh, combine them, uh, then it gets rapidly complicated. 
So what is the, uh, so we've just solved one half of the problem. What about the other half? Uh, now, so let's just work out what the Hamiltonian would be, that would be associated with this kind of solution, which as I said, is characterized by this alpha. And then when you do this, what you find is the following. Uh, this is equal to, well, it's just standard uh, manipulations with this to build Hamiltonian. Let's just work out what PP is. And then it turns out that this is equal to E over alpha squared. Okay. So it already shows that if alpha squared is equal to zero, you have to do a separate analysis, but let's not simply assume it's not zero. So what you can see here is that uh, this, unless E is equal to zero, which is kind of trivial, um, this is not equal to zero. So how can we possibly satisfy this other constraint? And now the trick is, of course, we have to bring in another root. So assume uh, there's another root, uh, another root, let's call it alpha t day, okay? And further, we'll assume that the two SL2 algebras that are associated with these two roots commute. That's very important. Then, such that, that the two, two uh, uh, S, uh, SL2s commute. commute. This would actually be also true if you have more such alphas, then the, the total constraint, the constraint, the constraint would be the sum of the H alpha i. And in this case, you would just get H alpha with two roots, H alpha tilde, okay? Where H alpha tilde uh, is analogous, H alpha tilde would then be equal to another integration constant, the tilde, divided by alpha tilde squared, okay? So that's, uh, okay, now I'm going to, like this. Okay. So let's continue like this. So what to do? Um, Okay, so we have now sum of two terms and uh, the equations of motion require us to set this equal to zero. That's the requirement. Okay. So, um, well, clearly for this, you need this to be negative. And one way to make it negative is to combine the real root, a real root alpha with an imaginary root alpha tilde. Uh, then, only then, are you able to solve this Hamiltonian constraint. So, for this, um, we have done the following. Um, this just by way of example. Uh, because, like, uh, what do you mean by combine? Like, you want to allow to well, I, I will now make a more general ansatz. Okay. Because before the ansatz was, before the ansatz was like this. Alpha e alpha e uh, phi times h. Uh -huh. And I don't want to, in principle, modify the ansatz by writing a alpha tilde, e alpha tilde, e to the phi tilde, of h tilde. That's the more general ansatz. And in which case, if this was a finite dimensional E algebra, I would get some polar like uh, structure if I worked out this. Uh, however, uh, well, so this, this we say is a positive root. Uh, for this, uh, we have to 
they'll pick some root that squares to, uh, to a negative number. And, uh, well, the example we took is that for, so example, example, so we take A alpha is equal to the uh, alpha zero, that's the, that's the extended, this exceptional root, and it's level one because the condition is one, so that will be associated with a threefold. So that's here. And for the alpha tilde, uh, we take uh, the, the uh, uh, fundamental weight associated with the outermost, uh, uh, not sure that I got the, no. That's, uh, you see this, what takes the fundamental weights which uh, are orthogonal to the simple rules. So these, so then, so here we have this. And this was uh, this was number seven, eight, nine, and zero. And if we take the root, this would only square to, uh, to something not zero for this root. But we're taking alpha as this root, so it follows that alpha times alpha tilde is equal to zero. Furthermore, we have alpha squared equals two, and uh, alpha tilde squares to, it turns out, this is explained in our paper, to minus 42. So it's already rather uh, negative. And the level of that root is uh, 21, which means that it starts out with 21 times alpha zero plus one. Okay. So I, I have a question. In in which sense is this choice unique? I mean, this, there's nothing unique about it. So in, in fact, no, not at all. It's this is you have you know infinite number of possibilities here. However, you have to for this kind of calculation that we're trying to do, you have to uh, I mean you have to pick it in such a way that you can manage and you can handle the calculation. And you know, one way to see how, how I said the two uh, subalgebras have to commute. Uh, so this this relation will guarantee that H uh, tilde commutes with E alpha and H commutes with e, e alpha tilde. So that's guaranteed by this. But what do we do about uh, this? Okay. Now, this will not vanish. This will give you something. And it will give something that in the root space uh, of the root, that's the sum of the two roots. Okay. Uh, in fact, you can calculate what the norm is of this thing. This has uh, alpha plus alpha tilde square will have. It's just the sum of these two, so it's minus 40. So, in general, this will not vanish. Now, at this point, we look at the tables of multiplicity. Such tables are available. And uh, the table tells us that the multiplicity of alpha tilde, meaning the number of independent D algebra generators associated with this particular group, is equal to 4 billion, uh, 3, 4, it doesn't really matter, I could just write any number. I guess nobody's able to check this in his head or her head. Okay, so that's a huge number. So we have a huge number of generators to choose from for E alpha tilde. And then we should check out of alpha tilde is equal to, but this is less. This is two, two one. Uh, six, what is nine? And it's smaller than. Not, I'm not showing this because there's anything I can do with it because nobody is able to write down these three algebra elements. However, we know the dimensions of the root spaces, and therefore, um, if this is true, we can 
because the dimension of this space is larger than, uh, than this space, there must be a huge kernel. And therefore, by picking a particular, there's many ways to do this, a particular combination of this root space generated, all of which are associated with, this, with these roots, we can actually achieve that this can be this. So choice exists, choice of, of the alpha in there such that things can be. You see, this, this makes life uh, very simple because in this case we can even um, further simplify this. In fact, I didn't say this, uh, but uh, the solution of this equation is of course trivial if c is equal to zero. And the c is the one, the thing that goes with this uh, step uh, generator. So if c is equal to zero, uh, then this is simply linear motion. So phi of t uh, is uh, square root, square root of e times, uh, so c equals zero, let me write it here, and phi of t is square root e, e minus zero. Okay. okay, so in that case, you can simply put this equal to zero. And uh, because then we still have the e tilde, uh, this thing is negative, then we can actually solve the Hamiltonian constraint. Okay. Um, um, so, so, sorry, uh, could you please uh, say again about this constraint? Why we need to choose this? Well, we need to choose it because, as I said, uh, we not only have to satisfy the geodesic equation, but we also have to satisfy the Hamiltonian constraint. And this means that uh, e divided by alpha squared plus e tilde divided by alpha tilde squared has to be okay. okay, and now we know that alpha squared tilde squared is minus 42. So we have to pick e tilde to be equal to 21 times e. Then we can solve this equation. For this particular choice. As I said, this, there's an infinite playground here to, to produce such solutions, but most solutions, most onsets will be such uh, that this thing doesn't commute. And then you have a new generator, and then you start commuting, you generate an infinite tower of new generators, and then the thing goes completely out of control. So that's, in fact, that would be the really interesting uh, case to consider. But uh, this we cannot do. Um, in any case, if you now work out as a solution, looking at the uh, uh, solutions of the Liouville equations, which are great, then you find that uh, phi of t is equal to uh, minus one half, one half uh, log k divided by square root e, cosh square root e, e minus t zero, where this is another integration constant, and uh, phi t there of t is equal to, well, here comes the 42, uh, square root e tilde uh, t minus t one, so we can choose these coordinates to be different if we wish. Okay, so that's the solution. And now you have to go back to the dictionary, which I didn't really explain, which is how to map the solutions of the sigma model to a, a metric solution. And then you find uh, the following answer. Uh, you can squeeze it in here. So D half. Maybe I then we get the following solution. Uh, e s squared, after some work, of course, e s squared is equal to uh, minus 
Let me see. Ah, well, uh, 40 pi tilde with, with these functions, which I which I wrote down here, they're not visible at the moment, but anyway, never mind. Plus uh, e to the four thirds pi of t, e x squared plus e y squared plus e t squared. Plus, and then there's e to the two phi tilde minus two thirds phi. And here we simply have d y squared with the internal coordinates. And furthermore, we also have um, a three fold flux, which is at tx, y, z is equal to e divided by a cos squared. Uh, so that's that's the solution you get out of this. So here this phi and phi tilde looks like kind of a wolf factor type of thing. Uh, well, wait a second. Uh, so first of all, the solution here's the solution. So the phi is this function of t for phi tilde. We simply have a linear function. So you simply substitute these functions here and here and here. That's step number one. Uh, same here, you have a t-dependent flux that goes to zero for t goes to infinity. Uh, and now, uh, how do you see that uh, this is actually, when does this correspond to ex uh, accelerating or decelerating expansion? But this, uh, this was analyzed by Paul Townsend and, and Woodward already in their paper. What you have to do is with this metric, you cannot just take this metric but you first have to transform it to Einstein frame because otherwise your Newton constant would start depending on time. You want to analyze the framework where Newton's constant is constant. So you switch to the Einstein frame and then, and only then can you decide whether the solution exhibits um, or analyze the behavior of the solution. And then by doing a, some kind of numerical estimate, they can show that the solution uh, corresponds to an expanding universe, but there are phases where the uh, expansion uh, the uh, expansion decelerates uh, as a decelerating rate or expansion accelerates. So it's a sort of uh, in between um, in between a dark energy uh, a period, but then uh, the equations of motion tell you that at some point the dark energy uh, disappears as it were. Um, yeah, so I'm, I, I think my time is more or less up. Maybe you just give me so another five, five minutes to- You have uh, actually uh, one and a half more. Ah, well, okay, okay. Well, anyway, I, have, I, I didn't want to say too much about this, but as I said, this analysis can be found in, in, in this town and Wolfhard paper, very carefully done. Uh, as I said, you go to the Einstein frame, uh, you even then uh, uh, choose a new time coordinate such that it's really minus dt squared plus scale factor squared times eternal at the times uh, dx squared plus dy squared plus dt squared. And then you simply check, you, you, you inspect uh, the behavior of the cosmological scale factor and then you see that it's what, what it is. So that's... Um... That's what you said about the latent behavior. How, how about the early time when t is small or zero? Uh, so actually, t actually, I don't remember what happens when t goes to zero. Let me see. Uh, no, I'm I, not sure whether there's anything dramatic happens that uh, well, I, because this this remains uh, uh, positive. I thought that the whole point was to have a have the Pro, profile of AT, right? Which indeed, yes. Which gives you a, a acceleration in both early yes, and late, but, late time. No, yeah, but I think the point is more not not to really understand the, uh, the big bang or something like this. The, I think the idea or the intention here is more to understand whether in such a theory can I have a profile of AMT which is such that 
uh, for a certain period of time, I have accelerated expansion like dark energy, and then it disappears for some reason. Because this is, you see, this kind of behavior is more sophisticated than just putting a uh, cosmological constant, because once you have a cosmological constant, it will go on forever. But, but this, is, this is more subtle. And it shows that in these theories, you can have uh, uh, rather intricate uh, dynamics, even with a, you know, ultra simple uh, ansatz of the type that we discussed. So, uh, excuse me, in, in layman's term, what, what plays, plays the role of dark energy here, if, if you don't have a cosmological constant? Well, I mean, you have matter fields that uh, you have this source. Um, uh, so it's not just the pure Einstein equation. It's, it's you have the, you have this. I mean, after all, this this thing, what the claim is, by constructing um, a model of this, a, a solution of this k e ten e ten over k ten sigma model, and by virtue of this dictionary that we um, was known already at the time, we know that this is a solution of the eleven-dimensional field equations with the non-trivial flux. And uh, um, uh, so that can be also verified directly. And uh, now I should say the following, because this is, I mean, this is in some sense still extremely simplistic. Uh, so we have here uh, a non-trivial time dependence of, of the spatial uh, geometry, uh, but we do not have a non-trivial uh, geometry in the internal space. So what is required here as a source is, is this threefold field, flux. By the way, there's also a relation to S-plane solutions that people have discussed, but we did not go into this. Uh, the original Townsend Wolfhard paper did not have this, but instead they had a non-trivial um, uh, a non-trivial uh, geometry in the internal manifold. Um, and now you can ask, what is there any way to get this from the sigma model point of view? And this is this we haven't been able to do because uh, because this dictionary that relates the supergravity to the to the sigma model point of view is only known up to uh, level three. Whereas, and I didn't say this in this emergent space time idea that we have uh, in mind. Um, the idea is somehow that the spatial uh, dependence of the solution gets spread all over the algebra, but that means that we also have to include uh, these higher levels and understand their physical uh, significance. So uh, what we did in this paper, we also uh, have a discussion on this point. Um, um, and there, there are various possibilities here, of course you can of course, you also have to go to higher level roots, and you try to mimic something like as a non-trivial spatial geometry in the internal uh, dimensions, but then there appear uh, discrepancies between the sigma model point of view and uh, uh, the gravitational theory point. Because as I said, Wolfhard and Townsend had the original solution didn't have the flux, but you had some non-trivial uh, geometry in the internal space. And in order to understand that from the sigma model point of view, we would have to better understand uh, the um, physical significance of these higher level uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, let's see what else is here. Uh, you know, another interesting feature that uh, hasn't really been discussed is, uh, is um, is the fact that also the internal dimensions have this time dimension. So it's not just the four dimensional space that expands or, or contracts or whatever, but it's also at the same time you have uh, non trivial dynamics in the internal dimension. Uh, what this means physically, uh, I guess, is still not really understood because if you think about a Kaluza Klein modes, then this would mean that the if you have a discrete spectrum, suppose you can arrange for a discrete spectrum, it would mean that your the masses of your Kaluza line states become uh, time dependent. So that's uh, um, that's not clear what uh, this means. And I don't think they 
actually discuss this part in the paper as far as I can tell. This question. So, as I said, there's in principle, uh, you know, it's an infinite playground here, and you could try other solutions with uh, more. You know, you could try to arrange for a somewhat bigger set of of commuting subalgebras, and then you would end up with a tonal-like system. Again, you can basically solve it. But the crucial feature to make this to keep this manageable and under control. The crucial feature is you, you must make sure that such commutators vanish because the moment they don't, then you, you generate an infinite string of higher level of operators and you have absolutely control, no control uh, either about the mathematics nor about the physical uh, significance or physical interpretation of these of states. So this is how should I say, it's just a sort of very simple, uh, this is the simplest thing in a way that you can do and where you can still manage the mathematical complexities. Um, but it should be understood that, you know, there's a vast range that's completely unexplored of, of degrees of freedom of uh, the, the dynamics and uh, furthermore, the dynamics of the sigma model, we don't quite know how to, we don't know related to uh, the actual dynamics in space and time. So I guess I stop here. So if there are any questions, then uh, you can ask them now. We have to clap. So please ask questions, those who are uh, listening from Zoom. Please unmute yourself and ask questions. I don't know anybody can help. Would it be of any help to hello, hello, Herman? Hello. Hello. Would it be of any help to consider simpler hyperbolic algebra? No, because uh, that that's not much of a help because uh, of course, one can look at the hyperbolic Katsuburi algebra as associated with pure gravity. This mm -hmm. is something called AE3. Yes. But, uh, so that at first sight looks much simpler. But this problem that, you know, that the, you, you start, once it doesn't commute, you, uh -huh. you get an infinite chain, exploding chain of, of new D algebra generators. That is also there in AE3. So uh, well, in that context, it doesn't really uh, help very much to, okay. um, to look at how the, and the algebra, because um, I would say there are much more basic issues that we don't understand. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Please ask. Please unmute your microphone and then ask the question. Yeah. Hello, Herman. This is George. Uh, oh, hi. Okay. Uh, yeah, a uh, question uh, about this, uh, this coefficient in front of internal dimensions. Uh, it looks like Dilaton field, yeah? Is there any mechanism to, to keep these dimensions small or they can grow infinitely also? Well, I, I mean, if you look at the solutions, they, they will have these exponential factors, so they will either, either go to zero or go to infinity. Okay. I mean, there's no, I mean, I see no way to, to keep this uh, sort of constant, Small. Mm -hmm. which uh, which might be a problem. Yeah, well, as I said at the very beginning, this is not meant to be a realistic solution. Mm -hmm. because there's still, well, I mean, I, I emphasize the mathematical problems, but but there's of course also this uh, physical interpretational problem, which hasn't even been addressed. So uh, uh, then. You know, that's one of the issues that uh, remains to be understood. Thank you. Any questions? Hello? Anybody have any questions? Do you guys have any questions? 
Comments? Comments. Comments. Oh. So maybe one could say, I mean, how does he raise the mother as in a I think you should unmute yourself. Unmute <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe one should say how this evades the mother's in Aminia's no go theorem. Yes. In terms of, I mean, this is just time dependent geometry. So how many people thought this kind of solution that do not exist in supergravity, but because of the time dependent drug state, they do exist. Yes. That's why it makes one of the assumptions. Yes. So that's, that's why you need these things to depend on the time in this particular way. Yes. Okay. Any questions? Last chance, otherwise I will stop recording. No questions? I think everybody have understood everything. Okay, good. Okay. So, I think now we can close.